Hello and welcome to another episode of Tales from the Doghouse Separation Anxiety Explained. I am Ness Jones and I am in Australia from Separation Anxiety in Dogs Decoded. And with me today is the lovely Stacey Bell with Focus Fun in the US. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Um, Today we're going to talk about scenarios and um, how we use them in training, when we might want to use them, how they can help our training and all that kind of stuff. But first, let's let's start with defining what do we mean by scenarios in regards to training. So basically, what we mean is that um, different context almost, right? Like, so there might be different setups or contexts which your dog finds more or less difficult to train in. And so that can be things like um, what the weather is outside or uh, weekdays versus weekends or who is leaving the dog or how active they are, or time of day, or can you think of other ones? I'm yeah. sure there are. Whether the dog is inside or outside, different doors that might be used, um, what's going on whether, in the streets. Pardon? Whether they went to daycare that day. Yeah, yeah. Did they have a bad experience? Did they have to go to the vets? Is there some external, is next door doing some building work? So you can't do much about that, but you can't, well, you can. There's still things we can do that could maybe help our dogs across that. Um, I think with um, why we might change a scenario is possibly, for example, um, a dog that's got a fear history that's had lots of bad experiences with one scenario might benefit from changing that to a different one that's not always possible so if a person is in a house and you wanted to change the exit point then there usually are more than one exit point in the house but if that person is in an apartment that's not going to be the case so we can not always possible yeah we can only work with what we can work with but sometimes Mm -hmm. it can make a huge difference right right and so one of the kind of one of the things that we can look at as to when we're trying to determine whether or not we need to break apart training into different scenarios is if we start seeing trends. Like, so we all know that variability is a normal part of home alone training. We've talked about this on the show. It is such a, such a normal part of training. So I'm not trying to say that if you notice any variability, then um, you definitely need to reassess and and break things up into different scenarios. But what I am saying is that if you're seeing a lot of variability or if you're kind of feeling stuck or unable to get traction, sometimes looking over your training history um, can enlighten you as to if there's a, a trend going on, uh, you know, is your dog struggling more in the mornings or um, during the weekdays or when dad leaves them versus mom or something like that. And that's really the benefit of um, one of the benefits of good note taking, right? So we always will say, make sure you're taking notes and tracking things. And, and that's one of the um, advantages is that you can look back on your sessions and say, wow, you know, all of the sessions that snuffy struggled on were in the morning. So then we might need to break um, morning and evening sessions apart to let snuffy progress in each scenario snuffy. at a rate that's comfortable <laughs> with them. Actually, one of my from. names, dog's name is snuffy, but it oh. is like Roscoe and snuffy are like my like kind of dog names that I use for examples a lot. Oh. <laughs> But then now I have a client whose dog name is Snuffy. And so I'm like, I guess I shouldn't use that example anymore because then you might think I'm talking about them. (laughs) In this case, I wasn't. I was just using the generic Snuffy. His his full name is Mr. Snuffleupagus. Oh, that's an awesome name. It is. It is a very awesome name. What's that? Say it again. (laughs) Mr. Snuffleupagus. Mr. Snuffleupagus. Yeah. That's cool. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, like I, had, it a, I had one client um, that had, I had one client that had, um, she had to have a hustle bustle in the morning training plan because that was threw the dog out a lot. 
yeah, that was an yeah. interesting one. Yeah. yeah. So, so obviously the training scenario started without that scenario. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And plans, that's so yeah. Often, yeah, that's so often what it is, is what we are just training. And then we see, like I was saying, we see these trends start to develop. And that's one of the advantages of working with a trainer is that somebody has eyes on that kind of stuff for you and is, um, you know, trying to look for patterns and trends and then adjust training to um, be most efficient underneath under the circumstances that we're seeing. Um, so shout out to Jenny and Benji. Jenny, Jenny's dog, Benji, is 10 years old. And he was actually fine home alone, which is really interesting. But they went out one night and Benji had a really bad experience. It was a nasty storm and then he just couldn't cope. So at the moment we're doing their training plan during the day, but we will look at doing changing that scenario at some point. But we're just building Mm -hmm. up a nice bank of time at the moment um, to get him used to being home alone um without adding in the hard part yet Um, right right but that will so the training we've changed the training scenario in that sense I guess or we've actually started with a completely different scenario um before we introduce the the hard one right yeah that's that's a good idea the other thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about that situation is another situation that's kind of unrelated to trends per se, but will make training more attainable as you um, increase your durations is having kind of like your, your regular scenario that you've been training mostly in and then having an easy win scenario. Whereas like if you're up to an hour, like some people even 45 minutes, um, they don't have time to train for an hour every day necessarily. So having an easy win scenario allows you to progress in your regular scenario, but then also have days of the week where you're having, um, you know, 15 to 20 minutes um, exercises just to keep that kind of training mode going during the week. So you're yeah. still getting your five, five or six days a week in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one thing that is very much a pattern that I notice if we're talking about patterns is the times when the dog doesn't do well because they haven't had their normal exercise or enrichment regimen. Mm-hmm. So those dogs suddenly plummet in their ability to cope with being home alone and, and it's quite obvious why. So mm-hmm. um, that would be something that you're not changing changing the training scenario so much, but you're making sure that things are in the right place, so to speak. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a really good point. If you're training and you're, everything's kind of going along smoothly and then you see a hiccup in the training, you know, sometimes you really don't know why, but often you can look at things like exercise and enrichment or um, like health related types of things, um, you know, that's a good place to first place to look or like a big routine change or something like that. So, um, you know. Yeah. So um, for me, one of the big changes I have made for a couple of clients actually is to, the dog's got a fair history of being outside when left alone so by bringing mm. them inside that has completely flipped the switch switch flipped the switch <laughs> for those dogs um yeah so that's a big one i think so mm-hmm. we can look at things that maybe you guys won't notice as well whether it's a certain door or a certain yeah time of day those sort of things that um mm-hmm. i still love the story you tell stacy about the dog that, <laughs> that was training did really well when this certain patch of sun was streaming through the window. Yes. I love that. Yeah, story. that yeah. sunspots were key for that one. And I actually, it's, um, I've noticed that amongst other dogs too. And I, you know, if I was the inventor type, I would invent <laughs> a sunspot machine <laughs> well, <laughs> because it no. made such a difference for these few dogs that I'm like, 
dude, if there was a sunspot machine, they would buy it and their dog would be acing every session, you know? Maybe, I mean, you could buy those studio lights that, that have mm-hmm. a lot of heat come out of them. Yeah, um, that's true. Maybe <laughs> they could just do that instead of like me going through the process of inventing something. Yeah. Which is, it's not likely. I mean, you know. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. It's probably well, not going to happen. If the sun is like to the west and the windows facing the east, they could set up a series of mirrors to reflect it and bounce. Nice. Until it gets into the spot. That sounds really complicated, but I like it. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> um, what are, I think for me, the most common scenario like different scenario that I use. I almost all my clients, I set up with an easy win scenario just because, you know, if you're short on time, I feel like better get in a, a quick short one than anything else than not doing training at all. So <clears throat> I have easy wins for most of my clients. And um, I also, for a lot of my clients, there will be a time of day slash activity level. Like sometimes it's, it seems like it's time of day, but it's mostly that they're just more active in the morning or more active at four o'clock. If they're a puppy, (laughs) that seems to be the case for a lot. So, you know, um, looking at that seems to be a big one, um, for couples sometimes, um, who's doing the leaving can be a big one, but, um, that has not actually impacted training for a lot of my clients, as much as I would think it would, Mm -hmm. although one person leaving versus two people leaving can also be something that complicates training. Um, And you might want to break out in a different scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. um, Same as you, I've had a client in particular that has a sleepy, calm training plan and then the active kind of, well, you know, I want to do something. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And I think it's worth mentioning, and I think we both kind of alluded to this, but I think it's worth mentioning outright is that, um, you know, when we're starting out training, we're wanting to start in that easiest scenario. So if we have identified um, straight away that it's more difficult for the dog to train um, at a certain time of day or activity level or whatever it is, then we would usually kind of put that on the back burner until the dog has like a good foundation of really consistent um, positive experiences in their easy scenario or easy est scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For sure. So another reason why we might hold off um, on adding secondary scenarios or tertiary or whatever um, scenarios until a little bit later is that it does kind of, it can feel like it complicates training a little bit. But remember when you're working with one of us, we're tracking all of that for you and we're keeping track of where you are in each scenario and making sure that we're um, progressing or giving you exercises. So your dog can progress at a rate that they're comfortable with in that given scenario. So while it can feel like it might, you know, add a layer of complexity, complexity, nice complexity, really, you know, we're taking that part of that. We're taking care of that part of it for you. Mm. So, um, yeah, tracking so is okay. really important. Yeah, I think I think the tracking of progress, whether it's an easy win or a different scenario, is really really important. Yeah, yeah, I do. See, I, th- I think so too. Not only um, so you can make sure that your training plan is effective, but also because there are ups and downs in training that you know you can, you know, have a bump in the road or your dog cannot do that well on an exercise and it feels really demoralizing. But if you can look at a graph of where you started and where you are now, even with the blip, I think that can really help pick you up and, and make you realize that when you're looking at the overall progress, um, you're, you're still getting there. That's such a good point. Sometimes when there is a blip, I actually pull up. So if I'm, I catch up with my clients once a week um, mm-hmm. I'll actually pull up their first video that they submitted. 
And oh, say, wow, hey, that's a good look idea. Look how far you've come. Like it feels like this is the end of the world or, you know, you're frustrated and overwhelmed and you're sick of it. But actually you forgot, you forget or, you know, what it actually did look like before you started mm-hmm. this training. So even though you've had hit a blip, guess mm-hmm. what? This is what you used your dog used to be like, and how much right. is that? So yeah, mm-hmm. and and yeah. if there's, if sometimes they will send me before they start training. Obviously, we never want to have over threshold dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, we just want to keep them in the safe zone. But sometimes they've captured video of their dog pre-training where it right. is completely over threshold, and if you hold on to that, and you can say, "Hey, remember this?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's good because they can they yeah we can they can see what what's been going on and it gives encouragement etc right yeah. right it's so important to celebrate the wins celebrate yeah. the wins um okay I think that's all I have on scenarios do you have anything that we've forgotten I can't think of anything I mean as, as you say like working with us uh, sometimes I think um, our clients are, are too close to, well, A, they don't have the certification, the skills, the, the knowledge set to help their dogs and identify what could be changed, but also where they can be too close to the situation as well. So we come in with, uh, we're not subjective, we're objective um, in in many senses. I mean, I fall in love with all my clients' dogs, so I am a little bit subjective. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. on a in a training scenario, a training uh, perspective, sorry, I'm objective. So I can look at something that's going on and say, hey, maybe we can change this up a little bit. Um, and it, it, as I said, the, my clients might be just too close to the situation to see to see it for themselves, right. which is normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so normal. Like even when, <clears throat> you know, Rowan is going through a hard patch with some kind of training, sometimes I have to like take a step back and say, what would I tell a client? You know, yeah. because like in the moment I'm like, wait, what? What's going on? What do I do? You know, but then taking a step back and, and just like reframing it like that will help me. Um, and I've also worked with other trainers Hmm. who have dogs with separation anxiety and they might even specialize in separation anxiety, but it's just like, so they had the the total skill set is there. It's just when it's your dog, it's hard to have the perspective and and having somebody else make the decisions for you about, you know, is this, how do I rate this exercise? Do I separate out a scenario? Um, What should my next training target duration B, you know, all of those things when they're like, when somebody else is telling you what they need to, what they need to be, it takes something off of your plate. So you can, you know, just do the work and, and not have as so many conflicting emotions surrounding it. Yeah, that's so true. Take, well, you know, taking the thinking out of it for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah. that applies to most people in life in general, I mean, but with my dogs, if I'm doing a training exercise in terms of just general obedience, like, you know, on a trial field, um, you know, healing up the field or whatever it is, and something's going wrong, maybe I can't work out what it is. I need that outside eye to say, to, to w- discover it for me because I'm not seeing it. I'm too close to the situation. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you guys for joining us and listening to us discuss scenarios and how they might apply to your training and help your training go more smoothly, more consistently, and more efficiently. We will see you next time on Tales from the Doghouse, Separation Anxiety Explained. I am Stacey Bell with Focused Fun. You can find me at Focused Fun Dogs on Facebook and Instagram and focusedfun.net on um, the regular (laughs) (laughs) and i'm ness jones i'm from separation anxiety in dogs decoders you can find me at nessjones.com that's easy isn't it um guys we do work remotely and globally so if you need help reach out to us but in the meantime if you're watching us on youtube please subscribe to our channel Um, we would very much appreciate it and if you're listening um to the podcast um 
make sure you um, like, subscribe, follow, et cetera, et cetera. But again, thank you. See you next time. Or here. Bye. <laughs>